So we have been talking about the reformation in Germany, which basically is accomplished. A good part of Germany has become Lutheran. <clears throat> Pope had lost his control in those portions and also the emperor, though he is still the emperor of the whole Europe, uh, <coughs> he had to make many concessions because of uh, Lutheranism. Uh, there were three stalwarts of reformation, Luther in Germany, Swingley in uh, Switzerland, and uh, <coughs> John Calvin in Geneva. So these three men, they have some things in common, but they have a lot of things different. Luther and Swingley, their difference is only actually uh, two months in age. Only two months, you know. Luther was born November 18, 1483, and uh, Swingley was just uh, two months afterwards. But there was uh, January 1, 1484, that's when Swingley was born. Uh, there's a lot of difference between these two men, though. <laughs> Luther was an Augustinian monk, but Swingley had never been ordained for uh, priesthood or he was not a monk. Uh, Swingley never had a spiritual struggle before salvation that Luther had. Luther gone through a great spiritual struggle. And Luther's education was basically in law and theology, you know, scholastic theology. Luther actually came out of the dark medievalism, uh, but Swingley received his education under the influence of Renaissance. He read the ancient writings of Greeks and the Romans. Besides, he studied in Basel, Bern and Vienna, some of the then famous universities. He received his master's degree in 1506. In 1519, Swingley became pastor of the church at Zurich, the most important part of Switzerland. He was also chaplain in the army of Switzerland. The difference in their bringing up and their education and all these things reflected also in their theology and their struggles. You know, Luther was a devout Catholic. He was ordained to be a priest and an Augustinian monk. Uh, so, even though he brought reformation, on his part actually reformation was not necessarily a deliberate act of Luther. Luther only wanted to remain in the Roman Catholic Church and correct the mistakes of the Roman Catholic Church. But the Roman Catholic Church never allowed him to do that. So he was forced out. But Swingley was different, you know. Swingley uh, was influenced by the writings of Luther, definitely. You know, Swingley never wanted to remain in the Roman Catholic Church, though he also was a Roman Catholic. Swingley was under the influence of Erasmus. You know who is Erasmus? Mm. He was probably the last of the, the uh, scholastics the Renaissance scholar, a great Greek scholar, especially of Koine Greek. His greatest contribution to the Christianity is his Greek Bible, you know, Erasmus Bible. And Swingley and Erasmus were, you know, more acquainted each other than Luther and uh, uh, Erasmus was. Uh, so naturally Swingley was under the influence of Erasmus. Uh, he studied New Testament theology and the Church Fathers. He had no intention of attacking Roman Catholic Church either. His idea was that of Erasmus. That is, educate the people and change. Luther's idea was, you know, there were so many evils in the Roman Catholic Church. For example, the, uh, the indulgences and, uh, you know, uh, 
many such things and and uh, and he wanted to change them but it was difficult to change because the rome never allowed in 1588 indulgences came to switzerland and swingly attacked systematic attack on rome uh, swingly removed all images from the churches at zurich you know luther did it much later in the reformation actually the people did it but in the case of uh, swingly you know he has taken the initiative to remove all images also the mass was abolished there is no mass altars and relics and the processions were all discarded he changed the government of the church the city council was in charge of the church he changed the school system from surich reformation slowly moved to other parts of switzerland however many parts of the country remained roman catholic so in the case of swingley reformation was was more calculated and deliberate in the case of luther reformation was the natural consequences of some of the mistakes the rome has done and you know <clears throat> luther had to oppose them because uh, he thought they were a burden on the people in addition to being a violation of the scriptures and frederick himself was tired of the roman catholic church and pope and all so he also wanted uh, to end the authority of uh, pope over germany and swingley and luther both were in reformation but they did not agree on everything the main difference you know swingley and luther had was on the lord supper I think that i touched upon it last week what was the teaching of luther what was the name of luther's teaching on lord supper consubstantiation that means you know as we take the bread we take the lord with the bread corn but swingley disagreed with it he said no the lord does not come in the bread we are not eating the lord the phrase that this is my body you know take it eat it cannot be taken literally that's all symbolic language and swingley interpreted that the lord supper is simply a memorial yes actually the evangelical protestants have accepted that teaching as i pointed out last week you know it's a memorial there is no question about it you know why we celebrate the lord supper to remember our lord jesus christ swingley was absolutely right on it but swingley did not interpret the, the phrase this is my body <laughs> john calvin and luther and roman catholics they interpreted that statement roman catholics said that the phrase this is my body means the bread becomes the body that is ch- change luther said this is my body because the lord comes in the bread and of course john calvin the reformed church said that it is a spiritual presence or the mystical presence of the lord in the bread there is no physical presence by faith we accept that the lord is in the bread you know actually the lord is not physically in the bread so these three but swingley said no nah, all three views are wrong all three views are wrong but swingley really did not interpret then how can you explain this is my body of course we eat the body they beat the bread to remember the lord that's all only answers the question why celebrate lord supper but what is the meaning of the statement of the lord this is my body you know Uh, that i think swingley did not swingley left it unexplained and uh, so you take any standard book on lord supper you know by any protestant theologian they will all simply go and say that uh, you know that is a, a symbolic statement and then won't go into it they say that lord supper is a memorial feast we all remember you know we by breaking the bread we remember the body of christ was broken that's very true and by 
drinking from the cup, we remember that the Lord shed his blood and that's all true. <coughs> but, uh, <coughs> you know, what that statement, you know, is it, it's not changed, everybody agrees, but that statement, we just cannot overlook it and say that, ignore it. <coughs> is the bread a substitute for the body of Christ? No. The Lord didn't say, this is a substitute for my body. <laughs> the Lord said, this is my body. So many theologians then will say that, you know, the bread represents the body of Christ without undergoing any kind of change. No kind of changes. No change in, you know, either the substance does not change, nor the Lord come into the body, or even mystical presence and all that's true, the uh, bread represents the body. And when something represents something, you can call that which represents as a something, you know, yes. <coughs> and that's what it is. The Lord wanted the bread to represent his body so that when we break, you know, we are not breaking his body because his body is there, but we are breaking something that represents the body of Christ, you know, without undergoing any changes. Then the, boy, the bread becomes more important than if it's only for us, you know, you know, simply without explaining any of those things, say that uh, the only thing to, about the Lord's Supper is that we remember that Lord Jesus Christ died, you know, for our sins. That's all the Lord wanted. Then the question is, if all that's all the Lord wanted, why bread is necessary? You know. <laughs> After all, for one hour we are talking about the death of Jesus Christ, only then at the end we break. All that we are talking about is in that memorial. <laughs> we are saying, Lord, you died for us, and we read the crucifixion passage and explain it, and all that is to remember. Why the bread has to be... So, somehow the Lord intended that, you know, a representation has to be there. In the Old Testament we know that the sacrifices all pointed to the Messiah. They are all pointed. But uh, so the Jewish people kind of the anticipated memory. You know, their anticipated memory that Jesus Christ will come and will be, you know, uh, slain for their sins. They were doing it by uh, the, an animal that represented the Lord. In the New Testament, because we live on this side of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is not an anticipatory memorial, it's a historical memorial. He has already come, died, therefore we remember it. In the millennium also, uh, those who take the word of God literally, they all believe that in the millennium there will be sacrifices. You know, in the millennium there will be a temple and sacrifice and all that. Why there is temple and sacrifice in millennium? See, they are basically a continuation of the Jewish system that is not anticipatory memorial, that is memorial. The only difference is we use f uh, for the memorial the bread and the cup, but they use for the memorial animals. So that's again going to be continued. Yes. The, the Lord is not going to be right on the earth, you know, he's not going to be here, he will be up in heaven with the church. And so, in the millennia, the people will be remembering that. In the eternity, we will all be with us. Christ and all the saints will be together. Therefore, there is no need for memorial. You can just look at Christ. And you can remember, you know, hey, that those wounds on his hands are for my, me. You know, I don't have to I remember that through any, any symbols. So, because the Lord is not here, we being human beings, we need that sort of a, a representational memorial. So, Swingley is generally acclaimed that his theology was better, at least on this point of the Lord's Supper. I say definitely, he did not commit the same mistake that Luther and others have committed in wrongly interpreting the, the meaning of the bread and all that. But yet, Swingley did not touch on the cardinal uh, statement of the Lord, this is my body. He's from Gal Roman Catholic Church. So he was a pastor in the Church. Nah, that changed. When he started pastoring, you know, it was no more Roman Catholic Church. 
Uh, he did not give a name or anything. It was simply the church at, uh, at uh, you know, uh, what was the name of the place? Yeah, Surich, the church at Surich, you know. Uh, <coughs> but it was basically reformed. He was influenced by Calvin and he was influenced by Luther also some, but uh, more by Calvin and all. But he himself was a student. So that was a major difference. In the Revelation, there is this uh, portion, right, that the Lord uh, eats with the uh, disciples, waits. So there is a connection, right, for the, the Lord's table and... In the Revelation, the Lord eats with the disciples? What do you mean by that? Uh, I'll get that portion. Uh, somewhere it says, uh, where, where the Lord says, uh, what I understand the meaning is, uh, where he, uh, it says that he was waiting for this. No, Matthew is mentioning. Oh, the, he, he, the Lord said in Matthew that I will not drink this cup until I come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's in the, that's in the millennial kingdom. The millennial kingdom that is going to be, the Lord is going to come and establish the millennial kingdom and, uh, you know, everything will be in the order and uh, I believe there will be uh, the celebration of the Lord's Supper, the so-called, you know. I don't want to call it uh, the continuation of this one, but there will be a supper and the Lord will be drinking, uh, you know, wine there again. Yes. That, that is connected but, with uh, this also, right? That's connected with this, uh, well, yes. In a way. In a way, in a way, yes. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> yeah, any time the Lord had after his death, any time the Lord had taken the bread, like uh, on the way of Emmaus, you know, those disciples, two of them invited the Lord to eat with him. What did he do? Bread was there, standard. That's in every meal, bread will be there. You know, not our loaf of bread, but uh, uh, something like our our fulka. You know. <laughs> uh, so he took the bread, he broke it, gave it to them, and then he disappeared. You know, because they then immediately understood. You know, was that really a celebration of Lord's Supper or not? I don't know because they didn't invite him for a Lord's Supper. But there was bread, so he did it. So, it seems to me that, you know, uh, if uh, bread in the hand of the Lord is a wonderful opportunity for him to remind believers that, you know, I died for you. In the millennium, the, setting, the, the establishment of the millennial kingdom, uh, the judgment of the nations, for example, dividing them into right and left and sending the left nations all to, you know, damnation. And then the right nations entering into that one and then handing over the kingdom charges to David. But David will be ruling here. And there will be a grand feast and the Lord is looking forward to that one, the establishment of his kingdom, the inauguration of his kingdom. That will be a grand occasion. So there will definitely will be a feast. You know, will we be there to eat that feast? That's, I don't know. Yeah. You know, I, I like to be there. <laughs> I, <would like> to be. <laughs> I have a feeling that uh, because the Lord has come and taken us before that, you know, that event to heaven and uh, when the Lord comes to the earth to establish, definitely he's going to come with his saints, you know, so we are going to accomplish him, you know. Uh, he's not going to leave us there, and, but then after all this accomplishment, we may go back, you know. <laughs> uh, it's beautiful, isn't it? They, the, Jacob had seen a dream that a ladder from earth to heaven, and angels were coming up. And I always thought about what period of history that will be, you know. If that dream, dream is to be fulfilled, when it will be? Well, uh, millennial kingdom may be a good time when, you know, <laughs> and Lord and the church, they are frequently coming down through the ladder, you know, I mean, whether this is a literal concrete ladder or something, or it is a, <laughs> uh, you know, it's a ladder of, you know, because for us, the glorified body, we don't re really need ladders, but yet for communication uh, to go up and down, we need uh, something. So there will be something, uh, so that sort of an experience will be there. Or is it in the new heaven and new earth again? The new heaven, earth and new heaven. And what is the connection between the two? Maybe a ladder again, you know. Anyway, it's going to be something wonderful. <laughs> yeah. 
in uh, uh, so th these people had really you know difference of opinion on the lord supper and uh, and this thing was kind of dividing believers you know they create more flutter than what we think yes they create more disturbance uh, because the people were saying hey luther says this way and calvin says that way and the swingle says this way what to what to uh, do so on october in october 1529 you know luther and swingle met at marburg and discussed their views you know they spent a lot of time discussing but however they could not come to an agreement for a while swingle had influence on the believers in switzerland and parts of germany however swingle got killed in a battle against the roman catholic church you know <laughs> Uh, Swingley was a was an army chaplain, you know. Uh, the Rome wanted to capture back Switzerland. Switzerland was going; the majority of that was going under you know reformation. So actually, uh, Rome sent an army, basically, you know. You know, and of course, it is uh, Rome means uh, the the emperor, you know, and uh, Swingley. you know managed to get an army and he was a general so you know but in that one swingly was you know killed <laughs> you know it is debated to this day the action of swingly was christian or not should have he gone to fight against and get killed you know so after his death actually swingly's influence has basically gone down John Calvin's influence came in all through Switzerland you know not only in Geneva so rich and other cities also so swingly never really fared very well you know like luther or calvin swingly was in between you know he was very influential when he was there but because of uh, you know this going to battle uh, <coughs> luther never thought of taking arms against you know uh, pope and all that for our lord said that he who takes the sword shall <laughs> you know fall by the sword and a sword and that exactly happens the third reformer was john calvin and he was born in july 10 1509 and you know that luther was born 1483 and uh, and uh, swingley 1484 january 1 so john calvin 1509 so he was the yes the youngest uh, he was born in france noy in france near paris his father was an influential rich man you know <coughs> uh he had a lot of money also through his father's influence john galvin was appointed a chaplain at the age of 11 can you think that <laughs> yes he was, he, yes well those days you don't need to be very old you know by the time you are a teenager you are already in the army or you are already in henry the 8th married at the age of 11 or 12 <laughs> well <laughs> I guess people much or much old much faster than <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah he was very young actually um, Henry the 8th you know Henry had an older brother he was 14 and uh, Henry was 11 or 12 and uh, his older brother was married and uh, to uh, Ma you know mary uh, not mary what was her name oh cab not catherine what was catherine's first wife's name the daughter of the emperor you know charles he married her and uh, she was f two four years older than henry's brother <laughs> then matthew henry's uh, henry's brother and older brother married and died after a couple of years without having any children so then you know the king of england at that time their father wanted henry to marry the widow of the older brother 
So it was it was not allowed at that time in the church to marry your brother's wife, even when she is widow. So request the Pope and Pope then finally gave a special dispensation, permission to marry. So he married. Uh, so he was very young. <laughs> she was almost five years older than him, you know. So very young. She was 18 maybe, and he was 12 or something like that. You know, not very old. And they had seven children, I think. Six of them died. As soon as the child was born, children will die. All girls, all girls. <laughs> Only one child survived. She is later known as Bloody Mary. <laughs> she became the queen and ruled for five years. Anyway, what I meant to say that very young age. So at the age of 11, if uh, Calvin became chaplain, well, we may think that it's too early, but uh, his father was influential. John Calvin's mother died when he was very young. So John was raised up by a nobleman. There John Calvin was absorbed in the manners of aristocracy. At 13, John Calvin moved to Paris for education. You know, And John Calvin was a very bright student, very sick in body, very healthy in mind. <laughs> yes. You know, one of the professors of the university, Jacques uh, Lefebvre, you know, where Calvin uh, went to study, you know, he translated and he published all Luther's commentary, especially the commentary of Rom on Romans. You know, and Calvin was very much attracted by that commentary. That was Calvin's greatest influence for formation, you know. Many people came under the influence of God's word because in that university, you know. <coughs> Margaret, the king's sister, was converted to Protestantism. The new faith was spreading throughout France. You know, France became a bloody ground for Protestants. Later in years, uh, <coughs> St. Bartholomew's Day, you heard of it? That's a day when they planned systematically to kill every Protestant in France on that day. <laughs> and, you know, they have killed thousands of people. You know, all the people who are encouraged to shoot every Christian, you know. Left and right, the Protestants. So in the early days, uh, you know, uh, France had great acceptance for, you know, Reformation Truth because it began in the universities with this Professor Lafouré translating, you know, Luther's books and especially commentary on Romans. You know, it was read when professors recommend certain books, you know, those days students will read. And so a lot of intelligent people came under the influence of uh, Luther. So they understood the faith, but later things, you know, begin to change. Yes, the new faith was spreading, even the royal family, I said, Margaret, the king's own sister, was converted. However, opposition mounted. Uh, Lefeuille's writings were condemned. Anyone possessing any book of Luther or any Protestant had to pay a great price. It was a time... Uh, like this, John Calvin came to Paris in 1523, you know, that's when he came. So you can just imagine that the man stepped into Paris at a time when there was great, you know, yes, unrest. Protestants were definitely growing, there were a number. At the same time, you know, there was great price to pay for. And as I said, Calvin was a great student. He mastered all the classical languages. Classical language those days means Hebrew, Greek and Latin basically. So he mastered all of them. And he studied logic. He read all the writings of the fathers. He studied law. From Paris after three years of education he moved to Borges University to study law. Under a famous law professor. Here he came in friendship with many great men like Nicholas Warmer and Theodor Besa. Theodor Besa is one of the great reformers in later years. So Calvin slowly, you know, uh, came into the reformation. 
Sorry, Calvin changed from theology to law due to his father's influence. <laughs> On his father's death, Calvin stopped law, went back to theology. <laughs> yeah, Calvin's father was a very rich man, very influential man. No. Actually, that helped Cal Calvin a lot. Later, wealth and without working, Calvin could live comfortably, you know, as far as money was concerned. And uh, of course, he needed a lot of money because he was the leader of uh, Reformation. So, what was the opposite of yours? Not the theology, this is theology. Yeah, well, <laughs> Martin Luther was a law student. Okay. Yeah, yes, he went to law. Uh, the study of law is always useful in studying the Bible because uh, your ability to think logically and you know, argue matters and all that, because when you study law, you get an analytical mind. That's one thing. You get some, you know, lessons in logic and all that, that helps. Yeah. J. N. Darby was a lawyer, law student. You know, the a number of men who were used in Reformation were all had the study of law. Now, it does not mean that only lawyers can do that, that's not <laughs> the point. But the study of law will help, all things being equal. If you have an education in law, it will definitely help. So Luther was, I mean, Calvin was also helps. Uh, <coughs> but as a result of Calvin, our father died and then he shifted back uh, his studies. And late in 1533, uh, uh, Nicholas, he was rector of the University of Paris, had to make his All Saints Day address. You know, they, sell, they have special uh, sermons for special, special days. This is all uh, Saints' Day. The speech sounded like the ideas of Erasmus and Luther. It was rumored that Nicholas wrote the speech by the advice of John Calvin. You know, if he was professor and John Calvin was student. <laughs> you can just imagine that the professor has written his, you know, all Saints' Day message under the influence of and the student, as a result, both uh, a professor and the student had to flee Paris. Persecution started against them. How did Calvin get these ideas? You know, <clears throat> he got it from his brothers and from his cousins. That's what generally think. His brothers and from his cousins, they were already, you know, under Luther's influence and and uh, Swingley's influence and they already were converted. And his Greek teacher was Walmer, who was, you know, a great uh, uh, Protestant uh, reformer, so Calvin was influenced by him also. Yes, <laughs> Calvin was haunted from city to city. He often lived under different names, but everywhere he went, he taught small groups in secret places. In France, they developed a new system of persecution. A victim will be lowered to fire for a few minutes and then taken out. After some time again, he will be lowered into the fire, then he will be taken out. So they will keep on doing it until he will recant and he will say that, okay, I forsake Protestantism, I will be an obedient, you know, uh, follower of the Roman Catholicism. So, you know, Calvin was also had to endure some of these persecutions. In 1535, Calvin went into Basel, Switzerland. Here he had peace for a while. This time he used to formulate his ideas of the Bible. In 1536, he published what? The most famous book by him, The Institutes of Christian Religion. The Institutes of Christian Religion. You know, this book, when he wrote this book, he was only 26 years old. And to this day, I mean, Calvin has written many books, commentary on all 66 books of the Bible. Calvin's commentaries are very famous. But yet, Calvin's Institute stands out as a classic work. Tens of thousands of people have taken their PhD, <laughs> you know, writing dissertation on for this book, you know, <laughs> Calvin's ideas. And have you ever read it? Oh, you must read it. <laughs> Otherwise, half of your life is lost. 
I mean, you being a, a believer, educated people haven't read Calvin's Institute, you know, yes. <laughs> I will say, you know, it's not, it, it, you can get it now. It's but, downloadable. Yeah, download, you can download it, you can <laughs> write it. But it's a little hard reading, yeah. One of the problems with all these men, you know, who went for law, one of the problem is their writing is hard to read because the <laughs> the masala will be less there, you know, like a literary poet or a, a novelist write, you know, he will write uh, to make it more readable and enjoyable. But a lawyer type person will be writing more, the substance he will be writing to the point. To the point. And so Calvin's writings are very pithy and very, you know, very rich, but it's not easy to read. You may have to read at least five times before you will come to you know, first reading you'll get a lot of things, second reading more, but by the time you read five readings you will be able to kind of appreciate, you know, John Calvin. Do you have modern versions? Uh, I think they have a modern uh, translation. He, he wrote in Latin, you know, he wrote in Latin. So we have the translation. So different people have translated at different period of time. So, I am sure that there will be some later translations in our contemporary English, you know. The one I read was, oh, was not very ancient, but it was, you know, understandable as language was concerned. <coughs> the institute was basically a catechism, you know. You know what's a catechism? You know, catechism is, a, you know, is a question answer form, you know. You know, that's what basically a catechism is. It's a statement of faith, uh, but it is a, you know, prasnotra, <coughs> you know, padhavili, that's why, you know. Catechisms are used to teach children, you know, who made this universe? God made this universe. Who is God? You know, or what is God? So, you know. So they will ask questions upon questions upon questions and it's very good, it's, you know, catechism. So this was originally as, made as a catechism really to teach people of the fundamentals of uh, Bible and salvations, really. Uh, later, you know, that was the first edition, later he changed the format. And now it is not as a catechism. Before Calvin died, five editions came out. The first edition was just very small, you know, it had less than 100 pages. And the last edition is more than 1000 pages. Mm -hmm. So you can just imagine. So if you get it, you have to get the latest editions of Calvin. You know, that contains a lot. So <coughs> he wrote it as a catechism, but later on a second thought we may say that Calvin decided uh, he wanted to send this book to the King of France because the King of France has ordered for persecution and he wanted to appeal to the King and uh, tell him that what we actually believe. So he wanted to submit to the King with the request that you may read it and understand that the Protestants are not, uh, you know, uh, they are not against the church or against, uh, they are not heretics basically. You know, so this uh, whole persecution should be stopped. So he is sent it to uh, King Francis I to explain and that the people persecuted in France are not radicals but just true believers in the Bible. Calvin requested the king to consider the volume as a true explanation of the faith of the people he was killing in France. The whole book especially uh, the dedication was written in classic Latin and was translated into elegant French. In a short time, the book became known as the leading statement of the evangelical faith. Even today, the institute stands out as a classic document of Christian faith. You know, people were just translating it into different languages and it was spread to all over Europe. And uh, the difference between Luther and Calvin, Luther has written some books. But Luther was not a theologian. Luther was more uh, an evangelist, you know. Uh, Luther's theologian was who? Melanchthon. Melanchthon. Melanchthon was. Melanchthon has written, you know, Lutheran theology and Calvin. But Calvin was a theologian, you know. 
all at once he was a theologian he was a pastor you know i don't i don't say we could ever say that he was a, an evangelist you know yes many describe him as a prophet you know as a prophet in another sense the the prophets are the spokesperson for god who interpret the scriptures so that's what john calvin has done he was a prophet of the time you know and uh, the reformation you know spread to other parts of geneva and germany and and france calvin was a frail young frenchman with a thin long face bright eyes and a refined scholarly air who toward the evening on a warm day in august 1536 walked through the gates of geneva you know he went there little did calvin know or even anybody knew what that visit of john calvin was going to do not only to geneva but to a whole protestant reformation you know john calvin then became synonymous with protestant reformation martin luther is the father of reformation you know but john calvin is not the father but he is you know the the founder you could say the foundation of reformation you know he was the theologian of uh, reformation so john calvin was a great man it was a man called a feral who brought actually reformation to geneva uh, john calvin then went into geneva you know and uh, he made the things to move fast the city of geneva located on the western tip of the beautiful lake of geneva in the french speaking part of switzerland to this city the french evangelical preacher feral had first come in october 1532 you know uh, when was calvin born yeah so this man came feral was an inf- uh, influence uh, you know was an influential promoter of reformation as a result of his visit many of the waldenses we have talked about the waldenses accepted the principle of reformation the waldenses were persecuted and so they were basically changing place to place you know they basically attacked the evils of roman catholic church the evils and the misuses of it they did not know very much about the reformation truth of the bible but they knew what was wrong with the roman catholic church so they were opposing for that reason they were you know a lot persecuted but now when feral came and preached you know the uh, these people they understood uh, that it, what is the truth you know you can you can be fighting against the wrong without knowing what is the truth you know you know that's wrong i know that's wrong but what is the truth it will take time for me to find out that you know that sort of thing. you know that's the way these waldenses were there so but so they have now become part of of the reformation feral had worked in other places also feral tried to get foothold in geneva but he could not but he came back in december 1533 and this time he was successful when feral came to geneva the catholics were in majority but in a short time through feral's preaching the majority of genevans became protestants you know the whole city it's amazing you know how the preaching of the gospel can can do and there was no gimmicks or anything you know it was simple pure preaching of the gospel he preached the gospel he was a very good public speaker so he will stand you know different places he will preach uh, feral captured many of the famous catholic churches in geneva it said that soon an iconoclast iconoclastic right broke you know what iconoclastic right means you know icons means what idols iconoclastic means are those who destroy idols are called he is an iconoclastic means he was a destroyer of the idol so an icro iconoclastic uh, right means were people just take their axes and you know what are the weapons they have they will walk into the streets and get into the uh, churches and uh, you know monasteries and what they do whatever images come in, under their you know you know where they will just break them and break them and break them so a feral has you know actually encouraged it destroy all idols so all idols were torn out nuns and monks were driven out 
On May 21, 1536, the citizens voted in favor of reformation and Geneva became a Protestant city. So the people voted. We have nothing to do with Roman Catholic Catholicism. Geneva is purely a Protestant city. See the preaching of the Word of God, how effective the Word of God is. And today also that's what we need, you know. Uh, whether it is Roman Catholics or any other Orthodox people or that, the way they don't become Christian, you know, is by not listening to the Word of God. You know, you go to them, they, they are told, told by their priest and all that, don't accept any literature from them, don't allow them to come to your home and sit down and, and speak, you know. So they avoid, and that's true with Muslims also. The Muslims, they do not read Bible. They were told by some people that, you know, their readers don't read Bible. Bible is a polluted book. If you happen to touch the Bible, you have to go and wash your hand with soap. You know, it's required. Uh, but if any Muslim actually honestly ever sit down and read the Bible, he will become a Christian. There's no question about it. You know, the, and the Word of God is so plain, and so powerful, you know, it definitely will. That's what happened to wherever preaching of... Uh, the, the, the word of God went, it happens, you know. There's a small city called Kallurkad, you know, in Kerala. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that was one city, there was nobody, there was not even an Orthodox family there, there was nobody, only Roman Catholic and nobody. <laughs> yeah, I remember going in there, you know, and a few of our believers were there and we... Uh, we rented the, the uh, what do you call, the government guest house, you know, in Gallurgaard and, uh, you know, <coughs> we will rent it out for, uh, for a couple of days every week. And people will come, people from, you know, I don't know how many, all the cities all around, you know, there are 10, 15 cities, people just came and the classes will go till 3 o'clock in the morning, you know, some will come, some will go. <laughs> I still remember sitting there. The amazing thing is, around every small city there is a church, you know, Vajakulam and, uh, you know, Nyarakkada, Marga and uh, Todubula, Kalur. Uh, you know, and you know, in all neighboring cities there, you know, there, there's a church there. Because all these people had the opportunity of listening to the Word of God. There's nothing, there is nothing else happened. They just came and they could ask questions. They will be firing their questions and discussion will be going on all night. So people repeatedly heard the Word of God and so the Word of God will do the job. So anywhere you can start a Bible class. And if you get the chance for the people to sit down and listen to it continuously for some time, it's guaranteed. Unless they have other vested interests, you know, yeah. Sometimes some people have vested interest, you know. Uh, then it may not, but if they don't have a vested interest, then the teaching of God's word. So, Pharaoh has done that you know, very easily. John Calvin did it the same thing, the teaching of the word of God. And Luther also did the same thing, you know. But Luther didn't get as much time uh, because Luther was fighting against an enemy, an organized church. These people were not necessarily fighting against an, in the Roman Catholic Church as much as they were teaching word of God to the people and the people were doing the fighting, you know, so that makes a difference. And so all these times the city of Geneva was, uh, you know, writing against the bishops, against the lords, and against the Duke of, uh, and all these, uh, you know, authorities. The whole Geneva was in a political turmoil. Farrell found that he alone could not control the turmoil. He heard about John Calvin. John Calvin was running away from France for life. And he was going to Germany via Geneva. He stayed in a lodge for one night. Farrell was told by somebody that John Calvin is in a lodge just staying for a night. And Farrell went to visit John Calvin and said, you are not going to go any further. <laughs> You're going to stay here. And, uh, you know, he didn't want to. John Calvin said, no, I will go to Germany. You know, I want some rest. You know, I'm running away, running away. I want to spend some time in writing. That's my purpose. You know, I want to go to, uh, he's going to go to Germany and I, I wanted to spend time in writing, you know. But uh, he pleaded all night. 
and Calvin won't listen. Then Pharaoh finally got ready uh, to leave and he said these words. My God curse your studies. <laughs> if now in her time of need you refuse to lend your aid to the church. <laughs> That's his last word. My God shall curse your studies. <laughs> if you don't give help at this time, John Galvin said settle it. <laughs> John Galvin said settle it. You know, finally Calvin agreed to stay. A man of ordinary ability enlisted. A man of exceptional ability uh, for the service of the Lord. Just as Barnabas enlisted Saul of Tarsus, you know. Yes, that literally was true. Pharaoh was a man of ability, he was a great preacher, he was a good believer, but he didn't have, he could not be compared with John Calvin. John Calvin was a man of exceptional ability. You know, he has a mind that was uh, exceptionally high. So people usually say that after Apostle Paul, John Calvin was the most intelligent person he lived, you know, in Christianity. And that's, I think, true. After Apostle Paul, John Calvin comes. He has influenced the world, the Christian world, more than any other man, you know, any other single person. He was, he was a great man. You know, anything you can find written by John Calvin, any of his commentaries or institutes, you know, please pick them up. All, you know, 66 books he has written, commentaries, they are, ex you know, they are exceptionally good. I mean, other scholars have come and other scholars have written, but I think John Calvin stands. If on any issue, if John Calvin says, usually it settles except where he was wrong. <laughs> oh, John Calvin didn't know anything about Baptism or believers. See, for example, you see, John Calvin was not right on his doctrine of Lord's Supper. John Calvin uh, did not know some of the ecclesiology very well. You know, he knew the soteriology. Theology proper, soteriology, bibliology, and uh, you know, these fundamental areas, John Calvin was very good. But when it came to ecclesiology and eschatology, you know, all John Calvin, you know, and eschatology, the future things. That also he was wrong because he was, uh, they were all amillennialist, you know. <laughs> See that? <laughs> there is no millennium, nothing, you know. Jesus is going to come back and eternity is going to begin. There is only one resurrection. All the righteous and unrighteous will be resurrected together. You know, they take the statement by in Daniel. You go and sleep, you know. The righteous will be resurrected for, you know, eternal glory and others for eternal damnation, you know. So that's, uh, that's weight. <coughs> so now it's 19 years have passed since Luther posted the 95 Thesis on the door of Wittenberg. And now... Southern Germany remains Catholic, Northern Germany completely Lutheran. Calvin and Farrell worked together from August 1536 to April 1538 they stayed in Geneva. But the political enemies of Farrell and Calvin created riots and even wanted to kill both of them. Yes, so they had to run away. <laughs> Calvin ran away to Germany in May 1538 and stayed there till 1541. Farrell had to run away to, you know, another uh, new chattel, another city. There, until his death, he remained. Farrell remained and worked there. Uh, Calvin was invited to St Strasbourg by Martin Busser. You know, Martin Busser was a great professor and scholar, and he was a, he, he was, you know, a, gr a great reformer. He was a... Uh, <coughs> He was the one we made mention that at the debate at Leipzig, mm -hmm. you know, he was the one who was one. So, you know, Calvin enjoyed the stay in Germany. Here he married, uh, you know, Idelet, I-D-E-L-E-T-T, Idelet Van Buren, a woman from Southern Ireland. You know, <clears throat> here Calvin had the opportunity to get acquainted with the followers of Luther and Swingley. Actually, Calvin was not influenced very much by Swingley or Luther. Uh, he was influenced for the, the beginning of the Reformation. But in the refining of his thinking and refining of his theology, these men could not, because Calvin was way ahead, you know. Calvin was way ahead. 
And Luther was a simple theologian. He just, uh, you know, salvation by faith and and uh, and few things. Uh, but uh, Calvin was systematic theologian. You know, you know, Calvin is not a man who will take one passage of scripture from here and from there. But Calvin is a man who will, uh, you know, see things from an encyclopedic, you know, uh, view. He will see everything as part of the whole. So that was the advantage of, of Calvin. So Calvin got married. That's a good thing. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> Calvin spent three years in Strasbourg. And these three years were very fruitful. He read much wrote much, a new edition of Institute was published. He also wrote a commentary on Romans, which was acclaimed the world over as a classic work. And that's true to this day. You know, Ma Martin Luther has written a commentary on Calvin, but uh, you read uh, Martin Luther and, uh, and John Calvin, <laughs> you know, there is a whole. Martin Luther emphasized certain points, you know, so, you know, salvation by faith, salvation by grace, and you know, and that sort of thing. But Luther was not, uh, Calvin was not there. Calvin was an exegete. You know, Luther also knew uh, German, Greek language and all, but Calvin was a scholar in, you know, in classical languages. You know, he was a genius. So he could exegete those passages and his commentary on Romans is excellent. That it actually has, you know, influenced the whole world, we'll say that, you know, it, it uh, did. Now Calvin, after three years, he returned to Geneva. The situation in Geneva got really bad. The people in Geneva got, uh, you know, rid of all Calvin's enemies. Every one, every one of them, they got rid of it. And then the city council uh, elected only true Protestants. They wanted Calvin to come back to Geneva. Roman Catholics were trying to get the people of Geneva back to Catholicism, but no. Cardinal uh, Sadole uh, wrote a letter to the people using them to return to, you know, Romanism. To this, Calvin uh, uh, wrote a letter, you know, a reply when the Genuans really, which the Genuans really liked. So they went to Calvin and requested him to return. Actually, Calvin had no desire to return to Geneva. He was very peaceful and happy at Strasbourg. Finally, the Genevans persuaded Calvin to return, you know, and he came in 1541. On 13 September 1541, Calvin entered the city of Geneva amid great rejoicing and enthusiastic ovation. You know, Calvin entered. The whole city was there to welcome John Calvin. It was a big coming back. You know, something good, Calvin was persuadable. <laughs> Calvin was persuadable. Huh? Farrell persuaded him. Of course, he had to use some very <laughs> rash language. <laughs> but he persuaded, you know. There are some people who cannot be persuaded by others. You know, what do you call them? You know, very arrogant and very stiff-necked people. You know, even if you convince them your decision is wrong, they will stick with their decision. Because it's a matter of their pride or something that what I said, I said. You know. <laughs> Calvin was not a man like that. Calvin, you know, that's the character of a godly man, very strong, but yet persuadable by others. You know, <clears throat> some people are very weak, but not persuaded by anybody. They, you know, so that's... So Calvin is back. Calvin is back. It was God's providence that led him to Geneva. The rest of his life, he remained in Geneva. He changed the city. He separated the church from the hands of the political leaders. I mean, from now on, uh, Geneva became almost, if I can use the phrase, the capital of Reformation. I mean, that, uh, that phrase is not a biblical phrase, I know that. And yet I think this is the, because the teachings of the Reformation, especially the Reformed faith, the Reformed soteriology, and, you know, it all went from and Geneva. Calvin was the center. People will come there, you know. Calvin started seminary there, but, you know, and uh, training programs there. So people from all over the world came uh, to get trained. So he made the church very strong. A new church government with elders, deacons, and a teaching pastor was formed. The elders' office was to watch the moral standard of 
the church the reformed church or the presbyterian church you know they are called presbyterian because in greek language presbyter means elder so it is elders role but the one major difference between their system and our system is our system is the biblical system <laughs> <laughs> their system was very close to the biblical system <laughs> calvin appointed you know believed that the church should have a teaching elder whom they call pastor and the elders will be elected by the people they will be taken from among the people but the teaching pastor will not come from the people he will always be a seminary trained you know man who will be brought from outside that we cannot see in the bible that's why i said that you know <laughs> the our system is more uh, biblical uh, but what was then the job of the elders elders were the keepers of the morality and the ethics and that spiritual standard part was job of the pastor pastor will keep the spirit the, the doctrines and the teachings you know that was his the doctrines will be taught by the pastors and morality and ethics in another sense one will see the doctrinal aspect the other will see others will see the practical life now that's a good combination you know uh, the only problem is you cannot uh, quite justify of course john calvin justified it because in first uh, uh, timothy chapter 5 we have the statement that the elders who teach well and elders who rule well you know the rule well elders are the general elders the teach well elders are the pastors so but they are both are plural plural and uh, you know we don't see paul appointing teaching elder and uh, ruling elders separately but what he was saying is the fact is that if you have five or six elders in a church as the time goes within one year you will find out that some elders are very good in administration you know some elders are very good in teaching and preaching that distinction going to come some are very good in admission meetings have to be started in time you know everything in order and you know everything very meticulously in the church will be running but they will not be doing much teaching or preaching you know they are very good with programs camps will be run right in this and that and every sunday school will be very orderly you know uh, you know uh, if women have meetings that will be very orderly youth meeting will be very orderly you know evangelism will be done everything he will manage uh, but some other elders they have no interest in this mm -hmm. what they study in day and night the word of god and they will be excellent teachers and preachers Well I think for a church to survive you need both you need both <laughs> yes <laughs> you need both but to divide them as a pastor and elders you know I think that the bible does not permit that you know it's a it's Paul was speaking about recognizing you know uh, give double honor to those who rule well especially you know means even double double to those who teach and preach that was the intention of saying it otherwise wherever elders are appointed or he calling the elders and talking to the elders there is no indication that there are two groups of elders two kinds of classes of elders there is no such dis distinctions so i think you know john galvin uh, of course you know he lived much earlier than uh, we live so you know there's a cumulative teaching you know from generation to generation more light is derived by studying god's word but he came very close so the presbyterian form of government of course then he had more you know beyond the local church they had uh, you know more more organizations of that one so calvin made the church very strong that definitely you know calvin assigned the right of discipline of the members even to excommunicate you know he believed that those who practice wrong they must be you know excommunicated so, uh, calvin was a very strong disciplinarian and so he earned a bad name yes he earned a bad name because of this one even to this day you know people talk against calvin because he was very strong for example the case of uh, servetus you probably heard of servetus Calvin is accused by many as a murderer you know and recently came to my attention a, a small book written by you know some people what was the name of that person oh 
No, 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 and so they, what he was doing is he was denouncing Calvinism and going to Arminianism, you know. And saying that Calvinism is uh, taught by John Calvin who was a murderer. He was referring to the case of Servetus. And Servetus was a Roman Catholic. He denied, he rejected Trinity. He wrote a book against Trinity that he is pictured in that one, Jesus Christ as a created, you know, being. So the Roman Catholic Church condemned him a heretic. And to escape execution or burning, you know, he was a Spanish man. From Spain, where Roman Catholicism is very strong, from Spain he ran to Geneva. <laughs> See, now he's already condemned. If, they, if the Roman Catholics get him anywhere, they will burn him on stake because he's condemned. So he came to Geneva. When he's a, he's a medical doctor, you know, he's a, he's a famous medical doctor also. So Servetus uh, was a learned man, a physician. From Spain he came to Geneva. Uh, but he came with his book and with his ideas, you know. <laughs> the city of Geneva could not keep, you know, a condemned criminal actually, you know. They didn't want. Uh, but uh, John Calvin asked him, he can leave Geneva and go somewhere else, he will not be safe here because anybody who teaches against Trinity will not be, you know, accepted. But he refused to leave. Then John Calvin told him, you keep quiet about your doctrine, don't say anything about your teaching to anybody. For which he said, no, as long as I live, I will teach. So what is the option? <laughs> In the, the city of Geneva is whole church. The whole city is one church. The political administration is a spiritual leadership, just like in Israel, you know. <laughs> it's almost theocracy, you know. But the, the church leaders are the, the, the administrators of... So the, uh, the members of the Genevan committee, you know, they met together and they said, uh, you know, Servetus has to be, uh, you know, burnt because he denied Trinity. That was the constitution there. Anybody who denies the fundamentals of Christian faith has to leave Geneva. If they refuse to leave Geneva, then they have to, you know, suffer whatever consequences that will come. So, uh, actually, Calvin tried to save Servetus, you know. Yeah, uh, Servetus, but Servetus, he purchased his own. So what happened then, the city of Geneva, they voted, they have taken vote. You know, uh, John Calvin tried to persuade them, we don't, you know, somehow, you know, he's a medical doctor and, uh, you know, he's an able man and uh, we somehow get him out, but the city council voted to, uh, you know, burn him. And Servetus was burnt. So, you know, John Calvin was the pastor of the whole city. He's the chairman of the, 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 the municipal commissioner or whatever. You know, you can say that. So, actually John Calvin earned a very bad name. <laughs> Not only really Servetus, actually, they have, uh, you know, punished many people. In, they said that this is uh, God's church in the city of Geneva. Is, it's a Christian city. We will not allow anybody, anybody who practices immorality or drinking or, you know, and uh, gambling and all in a doctrinal, serious doctrinal error, you cannot. Of course, we are living in a day and time when you have the freedom to do anything you want. It is none of the business of the church, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't say that model is biblical because I don't believe that the capital punishment is the duty of the church. I don't believe that. Uh, but the thing is, uh, uh, when you have a situation where the secular government and the, sp the spiritual are both same, what will you do? <laughs> See, capital punishment is the responsibility of the state. So here, who is the state? But can the state uh, punish? Uh, oh, well, uh, that depends upon, uh, you know, that depends upon how you 
how you uh, make the law yeah make you your laws and the rules and all that you know the rules and laws are passed by the state you know so if the parliament in india wanted to uh, make a law that will say that uh, you know everybody who kill a cow has to be killed what will you do hmm? <laughs> is that law bad or uh, you know wrong is a different matter because you know you take into consideration the feelings of the people if everybody in india is vegetarian and they worship cow and all that thing you know you know we are not going to the merit or demerit of it so anybody who kill a cow will be offending the feelings of the people it could lead to a riot lot more people could be killed it may be better than uh, to stop it by punishing that man you know that sort of thing so we just cannot uh, sitting here and say that's at the time period and all those uh, things you know so john galvin not in the capacity as the leader of the church did it but in his capacity as the leader of the state or uh, the city that is you know I uh, did it. Did you mention that he separated the church and state? Uh, yes, uh, he separated the st church and state, but it's very interesting. Not not the the uh, kind of separation that uh, we would uh, like it. But here the situation is: you cannot separate. Like for example, can you separate the church, uh, the Israel, and uh, the political government of Israel when David was the king? You cannot. So, if somebody denied, uh, you know, blasphemed against Jehovah, what will you do? They will stone them to death. For example, take uh, even Stephen. Why did uh, Stephen was stoned to death? Because, according to the Jewish law, the Old Testament law, anybody who blasphemed, either the temple or the king or Jehovah, you know. you know they have to be given death punishment here uh, stephen is saying that the son of mary is god <laughs> of course for the jew it was blasphemy then stephen preached that god does not dwell in the man made temples they all believed that god's presence was in the so that was blasphemy one was blasphemy against god the other was blasphemy against <laughs> so what would they do <laughs> so was uh, was actually you know uh, Saul of Tarsus uh, legally wrong no Saul of Tarsus said that concerning the law I am blameless even in killing him so this is a problem where the the political administration is constituted of the spiritual administration that's what the problem of the theocracy in theocracy every offense political offense civil offense criminal offense is punished by god's people so that applied to geneva also now if i was there i don't know what i will do if everybody you know in a particular state if every country everybody is a born again christian and they accept bible as the basis and then somebody come and deny blaspheme jehova <laughs> what will you do <laughs> i would like to chase him out of the <laughs> country and you know, or put him in the jail for life or something you know <laughs> but then even voting is to be done what to do then the majority 10 10 members nine voted to burn him what you, what choice you have <laughs> see this is a situation so we have to go back into that time and element and then decide so i am not going to say what john galvin did is uh, right and i will do it but at i am not going to say that what john galvin did was wrong you know because john galvin you know lived in an entirely different situation then but i personally believe that the church cannot kill anybody that responsibility is not given to the church but here the question is different john galvin and the church did not kill servitors the state kills servitors but then state and churches 
the same, that's the situation. <laughs> when that comes, it's a very difficult proposition, you know, when you, you cannot... Every member of the Supreme Court is a born-again Baptist believer, so the case comes before them, and the Bible, they have to go according to the Bible. And of course, John Calvin's problem is that uh, it's a theocracy. For uh, we are dispensationalists, therefore we see the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. John Calvin is a, a, a covenant theologian, so he does not see the difference. So the Old Testament is binding, basically, the same system. You know, so it's a theological problem also there. You know, <laughs> so you know, it's. Uh, yeah, you know, the system is different. Yeah. <laughs> Even though the, uh, the political and the church is same according to the New Testament and teaching, uh, how is that equal to Well, the New Testament never had a situation like that, see? <laughs> the New Testament says, submit you to the government. That's what it says, Romans chapter 13 and all. That is the non-believer, right? The sword is given into the hand of the King, the, what is the sword? To cut mango and apples? <laughs> to cut the herds. So that responsibility of cutting the herds was given to the government, the king, the government. Now here happens, the king happens to be the believer. So what should the believer do? He would say, throw the, the, the sword away? Or he should hold on to the sword? This is the question. <laughs> Not, not a moral problem or something, this is regarding the scripture. Well, was, it, was a moral problem greater or a spiritual problem greater? Denying, denying triunity is a lesser evil than committing adultery. In the Old Testament, capital punishment was for both, you know. For blasphemy, it is capital punishment. God wanted, you know, everybody. God wanted, somebody has violated Sabbath, went out to pick up some sticks. You know, they put him in jail and God said they take him out and stone him. It's God who said it. That's the God, the same God. But the New Testament approach to... Uh, the, the New Testament approach the same way. The only difference is that uh, the New Testament, you know, will hand over that man to the government. He will take and do it. <laughs> when, when both are same. When both are same, you have, you have no... Well, bo when both are same, you have to, it's just, li just like that, you are the teacher and you are the father of the same child, you know. <laughs> you know, will you, treat, will, you, will, you, will you treat your child as a father in the classroom or will you treat your child as a teacher in the classroom? <laughs> you happen to be the policeman and you happen to be the father, your son has done a violation. Will you treat him as a policeman, write a case against him, or will you say that, son, you know, I'm your father, so I'm let you go, you know. <laughs> See, this is the problem. You know, you just forget that John Galvin was a spiritual man at that time. He was occupying the office of the judge. <laughs> What I meant is, even both are same, so the principle must be derived according to the Bible. Yeah, they are derived according to the Bible. Their, interpre their interpretation is that Old Testament, New Testament, there is no difference. Only the difference is circumcision was replaced by <laughs> baptism and few things. Other thing, everything continues. The same God, same Bible. If, it, if the case was it now, what? what? Ah, that is the case is now. <laughs> Let the case come. <laughs> <laughs> no, the case is now, as I said, that I will not, I will put him in jail. I will not kill anybody if I have to do that. I will put him in jail. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, putting him in jail until he dies is more, was it, uh, in a sense, a more compassionate deal or a difficult uh, deal? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, a, it's a very difficult, you know, if you put somebody for life in jail. Your option is either you allow him to pollute the whole believers. Because he says, he says, if I remain here, I'll teach it. I'll teach Jesus Christ is not God. Should John Galvin allow him to teach Jesus Christ is not God? No, that's a big question. John Galvin cannot. <laughs> Sometimes we may be more godly than God, you know. <laughs> Yes, yeah, sometimes we become more godly than God because then we have to condemn the, everything God has done in the Old Testament. These are the same human lives, right? For picking up some sticks on a Sabbath day, he was stoned. Was God cruel? That's the same standard. 
The same commandment is there, forsake not the gathering together of saints. What do we do with people who go out to pick up wood, you know, on, on, on the Lord's day? We just say that close our eyes. But does God close his eyes? This is. So when the state government, the state is totally pagan and the believers are in minority, then we don't decide it. They do. But when the state is completely Christian, and the church is the same thing, you know, then what do you do? You cannot bring an unbeliever to carry on the administration because we cannot do these punishings. Then we have to do what? The sword is always given to the government. The sword is. The sword has to be used. Whoever happens to be there. If it's Nero, Nero has to use it. If it's Constantine, he has to use it. If it's John Calvin, he has to use it. And this time in Geneva, the sword is in the hand of John Calvin, so he has to use it. So it's very easy for us to condemn. We can say that John Calvin's interpretation of the Old Testament was wrong. Yeah, that I say that, you know. But then John Calvin, you know, is responsible for his convictions. The thing is, when John Calvin was there, nobody taught dispensationalism. Jay and Darby came after much later. <laughs> so, you know, John Calvin didn't know anything about dispensation. They didn't even use the word. So, you know, their understanding of the scripture, he was honest with the scriptures. Anyway, you know, uh, John Galvin has earned a bad name. <laughs> Whatever, you know, I don't want to defend everything John Galvin did, but, you know, John, we need to understand why Calvin was forced to do what, what he has done. Even in that situation, John Galvin tried to save Servetus by asking him to leave Geneva. You go somewhere else. But he didn't want to go because he will be caught by the Roman Catholics and he will be burned on stakes, you know. He knew that he's a condemned person, you know. So he couldn't go anywhere else, you know. He could have gone actually to... I, hmm? Germany, I don't know what Luther will do, to be honest, you know. <laughs> I don't know. Luther never faced the situation of that sort, you know. <laughs> this is a very, you know, touchy situation, you know. Yes. So Calvin established, you know, Calvin uh, established the Geneva Academy, the first Protestant university in the whole world. <clears throat> Calvin realized the need for train to train ministers and preachers, not only the salvation of souls, but also the glory of God, as he said later. Therefore, all believers need to have training in God's word to glorify God. The University of Geneva was built both by the generosity of the king of Switzerland but also of the sacrificial giving of the people. People contributed. How many came the first year? I think 900 people may were admitted for training. <laughs> Something like that, yes. It's not written yet. Yeah, I read somewhere, yes. Large, large. Theodore Besa was called to be the first rector of the academy. Calvin knew Besa from the age of 12. Besa became you know, Calvinist, uh, Calvin's right-hand man and was pastor of the Genevan uh, Reformed Church for 40 years after John Calvin died. You know, this was a great man. In 1559, the third edition of the Institute was published. How Calvin could accomplish all uh, these was a puzzle because he was a weak, frail man with many diseases. But his will triumphed over all difficulties. Calvin died May 27, 1564. He was not quite 54 year old. Very young he died. He was ill health. I think he had tuberculosis or some such diseases. You know, he was a very sick man all his life. You know, I never read anything about Calvin's family life. I always wanted to, but I never came across a book that uh, you know, he ma was married, yes, but uh, but he had children also he had, but what happened to them and all that, we don't know. <clears throat> Luther was an evangelist, Calvin was a teacher. Luther's influence was in Germany, but Calvin's influence was the whole world. Luther was the bold leader of Reformation. His work primarily limited to Germany, 
though the spirit of reformation was carried out to other places calvin was a second generation reformer who influenced the world for theology church government separation of church and state he was a great commentator of the word he was founder of a university and an educationist he was a great man he was a great man stand take a break yeah.